I thought I'd give a catch up and a roundup of what's going on. Uh, Kalen Robertson has done a simply spectacular video about a fellow called Nick Shirley, who's an American um, pseudo journalist, podcaster, YouTuber, who has been going around saying that there is no war in Ukraine. And it's the most extraordinary story. And Kalen has got behind the story and spoken to the fixers who set up a car, set up uh, meetings and trips for Nick Shirley, demonstrating, uh, quite clearly showing him the the burnt out buildings, the war damage in Butcher and in other places. And uh, all he seemed to be interested in was the fact that there are some fancy cars, BMWs. I don't really know what a fancy car is, by the way. Um, but, uh, <laughs> unless it's, a, unless it's a Rolls Royce, uh, and then it seems quite pleasant, but, um, I, you know, it's, um, it, it's madness and it, and it, it, um, it fits into a, uh, to a narrative where, um, where it's not impossible to imagine that this fellow has been paid by, uh, Russian organizations to put out propaganda to suggest in the uh, in, in the um in in, in the build-up to an american election that public money shouldn't be wasted by uh, helping ukraine of course we should help ukraine it's the right thing to do uh and so so there's that on the one hand i i, I think that's probably the biggest story and all praise to kaylin for getting that story out there and getting to the bottom of it um, I'll leave a link at the end of this video to his video. Um, you, you, you look him up, Kalen Robertson and uh, C-A-O, Kalen, and it's a, it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think any longer that I can put a, put a link within the video for another video. So you have to go to the end of this video and there'll be a link at the, at the end with um, videos that you can see. Um, and the, the, the two other stories, which I think are interesting, um, one is the, is the story about the pager plot and, 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 the, uh, and, and, and to divide it into, into two issues is so easy when you're, when you're getting sort of spirited and excited on YouTube to, to think of everything in, in terms of uh, one black and white concept. I'm not suggesting things are shades of grey. I think that's a silly approach. But you can divide something into two black and white concepts. And so on the one hand, I think history is going to be looking at the pager plot for years to come as a, as a demonstration of hybrid warfare unusual, irregular hybrid warfare um, at its most brilliant. And, uh, and, and then the big question, was this an act of terrorism or was this a targeted attack to minimize casualties um, and, and simply to target army combatants? And, and, and I think there's arguments on both sides. Was it an act of terrorism? It's certainly a terrorist weapon. So now I think uh, airports are going to are going to stop people boarding if they've got pagers. Well, why would anybody s still be clinging to a 1970s form of communication? But if if a pager can be modified, then so too I suspect can one of these things. So I, th so I think it's, it's only a matter of time before the technology moves to a point where a mobile phone is dangerous. And so is it an act of terrorism? Yes, it's certainly using a terrorist weapon. And it's showing a way forward for terrorism, which is terrifying. But is it, is it a targeted attack? I don't think you can get any more targeted than this. This is a deliberate targeting of... Um, a, uh, of people who are connected to the Hezbollah movement. They would not have 
a pager unless they were part of that Hezbollah movement. Now, the fact that children can pick these things up is is simply uh, stomach stomach churning. But the but the um, they wouldn't have them unless they, unless their parents or their family was connected to a terrorist organization, an organization that has been prescribed in the United Nations. And like Hamas, Hezbollah has not contributed positively to the country where it dwells, that it controls. Hezbollah has not made Lebanon a better country, just as Hamas did not make Gaza a better country. Look to the Look to the fruits of these organizations to see whether or not they are worthy. They are not. You could draw the same conclusion about Putin. Has Putin made Russia a better country? No, Putin has pocketed the money for himself and his elite friends. When we go to um, this, so trying to find a trail, um, and, we, and, we, and, we, and we approach modern politics with the same criteria. So if it's good enough for analysing Hezbollah, it's good enough for analysing what's going on in the modern Labour Party, Simon Case, Sue Gray, and all that sort of squabble. Simon Case is about to resign because he can't get on with Sue Gray. Well, that's one way of putting it. The other way of putting it is, of course, that Simon Gray was intending to resign anyway. Sue Gray, who's paid more, fractionally more than the Prime Minister. The idea of having these spads, these special advisors that are paid huge amounts of money, is something that maybe should be consigned to history. If somebody is working in Downing Street, if somebody is working for a minister or for an MP, they should be civil servants, shouldn't they? Or if they are a special advisor, they should come under the civil servant payment and they should become civil servants. This idea of having a core group of people who are specifically advising the people who have been elected. We didn't elect these spads. And if these spads have so much control, we want to know, really, who are they? In the same way, we, we would want to know who is funding a political party. So the, the, the story that the Labour Party benefited from a four million hedge fund from the Cayman Islands just before the elections uh, from, from a hedge fund which was involved in supporting fossil fuel and arms manufacturing and trading. It's uncomfortable because it goes against the message that the Labour Party is trying to put out. As for the £107,000, is it 107,000? That seems very high. 107,000 pounds that Lord Ali has given to um, Sir Keir Starmer and his wife. Well, you know, do we not want the person who is representing our country to look good and to and to be, um, yeah? <laughs> I, the royal family always talk about wearing British brands. Is that not what? Keir Starmer is doing. He is promoting Britain. And if we don't give the Prime Minister enough money through the public person, it needs to come from elsewhere. It's as simple as that. If some Prime Ministers are rich enough to be able to fund their own uh, wardrobe, that's great. But if some are not, then they need to get that money from somewhere. And at least we know where it's coming from. I think, I think this is not a this is a non-story. And as for Keir Starmer's claim that, um, that that he would rather be sitting in the in the stands, or rather be standing in the stands, uh, than in the VIP room at um, Arsenal, uh, and that uh, and, and that by accepting the VIP hospitality, he's actually saving the public money because it would cost significantly more money with security to police the stands if he were to sit if he were to sit in the stands uh this is this is chop logic um it's the same sort of chop logic that actually the pope 
uh, Pope John Paul II put out when it was discovered that he'd built a swimming pool in the Vatican. And he said building a swimming pool in the Vatican is cheaper than holding another conclave. Well, he's sort of right in a way, but it's playing around with reality. And the the, the, the elected representative's downtime should not be something that the that the um, electorate is paying for. That should be something that comes out of the out out of the pay which we give to the elected representative, whether that's a pope or a prime minister. If we don't pay them enough so that they can have downtime, then we're not paying them enough. And it's as simple as that. So there's a number of very interesting stories. I think the the uh, the Tim Pool and the Nick Shirley story is probably the most interesting um, out of the uh, uh, out of the story. The, the story that um, uh, that, that Kayla Robertson is is putting out, and he interviews uh, Darina, the driver. He interviews Corey, um, the fixer, and. You know, he knows what he's talking about. I'm doing a talk tomorrow about um, Russian uh, disinformation on an on, on another site. I think I, I'll, I'll bring I'll bring you links tomorrow. Um, but it's it's something that needs to be challenged. We need to challenge this disinformation, and and we need to recognise that each story needs to be looked at dispassionately there may be two or three interpretations to a story but it's not about six of one and half a dozen of the other it's not about living in shades of gray it's about living in clear principles of black and white you just analyze the principles and i think we're living in a world that can be clearly judged as good or bad good or evil and putin to me and the Kremlin, to me, falls very clearly in the latter category.